So without further ado, I'd like to ask you to welcome Dr. Ahrens for our uh, inaugural talk today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I've got this. Okay, thank you, Dr. McGinn. Uh, thank you to the TUIs who made this series possible. I want to thank the administration and thank everybody on the staff who has made this possible. And I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Talking about contemplation, but, but what is contemplation? I'm going to be using a, a relatively general definition of, of, um, of contemplation tonight. A dictionary definition is just a long look at something, though I rather like the Jesuit Walter Burghardt's definition that uh, it is a long, loving look at the real. And if we think about it, how much time do we spend doing that? How much time do we spend looking at the real? If you've been a parent and had a child, do you spend time just gazing at that child, just looking, contemplating? Have you been out in the wilderness and looked up at the stars and just been amazed at the scope of the universe? Have you had moments of looking at, at trouble and seeing trouble and just being with it, gazing at it, trying to understand it? It is the beginning of baseball season. Have you spent time contemplating the Indians and how they will fare this year. We spend time contemplating all of these sorts of things, and in psychology, we have begun to start to think about how people engage in these contemplations. Before I go on in more detail about it, I'm going to start with a brief video. It might not be apparent at the beginning what this has to do with contemplation and the, uh, the uh, purpose of the talk. Please bear with, it's about two minutes. who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buffering his lordship's scones the most fair shop. But I was bludgeoning my peculiars in the pocket shed. Constable, arrest. Let me slide. How oh, would you know, madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. <laughs> this is a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the grass in the last bedroom. I was buffering his lordship's scones to the most fair time. But I was buffering my petunias in the pocket chair. Constable, arrest. This is our life. We're looking at one thing, and in the midst of that, many other things are going on that we do not notice. There's a term for this in psychology, inattentional blindness. Uh, what we are not attending to, we are blind to, we miss. We do not see that it's there. It's easy to miss something that you're not looking for. This, in fact, was a public service announcement from the mayor of London to promote bicycling safety. So I want to say, keep an eye out for bicyclists. They are often hard to see. As you were watching this, did you notice some changes? Perhaps some of you are very familiar with artwork, and you might have noticed that the paintings changed. Others of you might be very much into planting flowers, and perhaps you noticed that the flowers changed. Others of you might be haberdashers, and you might have noticed that the clothing changed. We have training in our lives that leads us to attend and to notice some things, 
even as we are attending to who solved the mystery. What sort of training do we have to look, to contemplate, to notice what is there? Does the way in which we've been trained in contemplation shape what it is that we notice? There are many ways in which we can be trained in contemplation, and I'm going to be talking about some of those tonight. And it's become of interest to psychology in recent years. There are uh, programs in contemplative science that are beginning to creep up around the nation at the University of San Diego, at Brown, at Rice, at other places around the nation. Psychology is starting to attend to these. But before talking about how I will talk about contemplation, I should say a word about myself. My training is in psychology, and in particular in social psychology. So I'm going to be approaching this as a psychologist tonight. Um, I have also had contemplative practices. For about 20 years, I've had a mindfulness-based practice. Also about 20 years ago, I did the uh, Ignatian exercises, the 19th annotation version for those who are keeping track. And as a Catholic, I continue to use an Ignatian approach to much of what I end up doing. That said, I am not a spiritual director, uh, nor am I a mindfulness teacher. I do not have those sorts of skills. And so I want to apologize for anything that I, to, that I say tonight in advance that I might misunderstand because I am still developing understanding there. My goals for today are to talk about some ways in which we might contemplate, talk about three of them. I'll talk about why they might be of benefit from a psychological perspective. And then for each, I want to come back and suggest we should be hesitant about thinking about what people like myself have to say coming from a psychological perspective. I'm going to focus first on mindfulness, then on gratitude, then on the Ignatian spiritual practices. So with mindfulness, you probably have heard about it. It made the cover of Time magazine. Uh, mindfulness is everywhere. It is in popular culture, in psychology. It has become something that is, is everywhere that we look at. Um, to give an example, I did a, a keyword search on mindfulness in a database. From 1980 to 2000, there were exactly 241 appearance of, appearances of mindfulness. That's 21 years. In 2015, there were 1,357 in one year. All of a sudden, in psychology, we've started attending to mindfulness, being mindful of mindfulness. Why? Why are we starting to do that? Well, first, what is it? Mindfulness, one definition is that it's non-judgmental attention to the present moment. So we're, we're noticing what is there, right where you are, and we are doing that non-judgmentally. To give you some examples, if, if you're so inclined, you can, you don't have to, you might close your eyes for a second or two and just notice your breath. This extraordinarily short version of this, but if in doing that you were able to just bring your attention and not to say, oh no, I'm not breathing, uh, or uh, there's something wrong with my breath, or something like that. You're, you're, you're being mindful of your breath. Other exercises, imagine eating one raisin, <laughs> taking a long time. Put it in your fingers, look at it, feel it. Put it onto your lips, bite into it without swallowing, and taste it, and then go ahead and swallow. Paying attention all along the way. This is one exercise that is used to try to build people's ability to attend to the present moment. In my own practice, we do much with, with movement. One of the movements is a simple neck rotation where you do what I just did, only you take about a minute to do that, noticing all the sensations that arise as you're engaged in that practice. And the idea is that Perhaps in doing these sorts of exercises, we learn a new way of contemplating, a new way of looking at the real. There's some beginning evidence, at least, that this can be psychologically helpful. Um, one of the problems that this has been worked on, used to work on, is with people with a history of recurrent depression. Uh, people who have had depression, and again, again, it's a terrible thing, and it's difficult to prevent relapse. So we're interested in trying to figure out how to do that. 
So in one set of studies, people with this sort of history who have come in with a depression have been given drug treatment to get out of the depression. And after that, some of them are assigned to mindfulness. For eight weeks, they learn what is called mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. They meet once a week in group for two hours. One time they meet for a day retreat to study mindfulness. They're given some exercises. That's it. They're sent away for a year. Do whatever you want to do. Control groups are treatment as usual. Whatever we would have been doing for these people is what we are doing now. They come back a year later to see which of these people have relapsed back into depression. Across the studies, in the treatment as usual, the relapse rate is on the ballpark of 63%. It's a very high rate of relapse. In the mindfulness, 36 from eight weeks of group treatment. So this is promising, it's been replicated. The people who do it are really terrific scholars. I trust them to do good science. Beyond that specific example, there are a number of studies examining treatments using mindfulness for anxiety. And these two have shown promise according to a good recent review of this. So there's burgeoning evidence that mindfulness might help prevent depression relapse might help us with anxiety, but why? We don't know. You'll hear much about this in the press, of, well, this is what's happening, this is. We don't know, it will take a long time to find out. I'm gonna give you three ideas tonight, though, about what it is that mindfulness might be doing that is helpful for psychological health. The first of these has to do with rumination. I don't know if you've ever had a moment where you've just had some terrible thought go through your mind again and again and again. You just can't get it out of your mind. There's some difficulty you've just had. There's something forthcoming, and the thoughts just keep going there. You try to get rid of them, and they come back stronger. This is rumination. What can we do with it? For people who have a history of recurrent depression, Perhaps there's a worry. I'm starting to show signs that I might be lapsing back in. And so this occupies our minds. So how do we get out of that trap of a ruminative cycle? One argument is that perhaps mindfulness training helps with that. In mindfulness, much of what happens is we notice that our mind goes someplace where we had not intended, and we start to learn to gently bring it back. And in that, perhaps when our mind is not going where we want it to, as we are ruminating, we can say, I don't want my entire life, my entire thought to be this thing. I will bring it back where I want it to be. And perhaps in that there is relief, there is benefit, there is some psychological gain from it. The second possibility, inner experience can sometimes be frightening. Uh, we have these emotions. They creep up in the middle of nowhere. I start thinking again about baseball. Um, but we have other ones that are much more serious. We have thoughts about our future. We might have a health concern that comes up. And all of a sudden, we look at it and we say, no, I don't want to go there. We might not want to th even think about going to see the doctor. And if we do that, if we have thoughts of danger for which we need to seek help, but we avoid them, this can be problematic. How do we do, deal with fears of our inner experience, with fears of our thoughts, with fears of our emotion? We know some things about fears of objective stimuli. If you are afraid of a spider, we have some great treatments for you. These involve exposing you to spiders in the nicest sort of way. We might have you look at a picture of a spider. We might then get the most innocuous spider at a great distance, caged in, shackled down, safe. And we teach you to relax to these, and gradually we expose you to them until you can find comfort and find a way of navigating in the presence of the spider. And that's great to do with something objective like a spider. But what do we do about our inner experience? If we're afraid of what is inside, how do we expose? One argument is that maybe 
Mindfulness practice can help with that. We can attend to our thought. Our thought is scary. We run away. We can develop the attention of bringing our attention back and being present in it and becoming comfortable with those things inside of ourselves which we would otherwise be inclined to avoid. And perhaps that lack of avoidance will end up being something helpful for us. A third way, self-management. Why did you come here tonight? Um, you probably had an intention, hopefully it was to hear this talk. Have you, has your mind wandered? Have you thought, I could have been out watching the Indians again? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on baseball, it's a recurrent, recurrent thought. Um, well, at that point, you weren't living up to your intention. Your intention was to be here. Similarly at work, I don't know about you, uh, my department chair perhaps will watch this someday. I will admit nonetheless, sometimes I do not fully have my attention on my work. In our family lives, sometimes our, our attention just isn't there for those around us. Our intent is, we intend to work. We intend to be loving family members. But we don't do it as our mind goes off here or there. We might not even notice. Does a mindfulness practice help us bring our attention to our intention so that we apply ourselves where we had intended to go? Might that be something that is helpful for psychological health? I could have given you many more sorts of examples of how mindfulness might help, and there are many scholars working on this these days. But I want to take a moment to push back going to do it in three ways. First, what is mindfulness? I sort of gave you a definition, but it was a sleight of hand. In the field of psychology, you're going to read in the popular press about mindfulness. They might mean things such as, we had people for 15 minutes do a breathing exercise. I have a published study in the journal Mindfulness on exactly that. It might be an eight-week practice, such as the one that I described. Other studies involve Buddhist monks who have been practicing mindfulness for many decades. All of these will be treated as the same. I am hard pressed to believe that they are the same. So as we're studying mindfulness in psychology, we're talking about it, thinking that we know what we're talking about, when it is very likely that we are talking about many things. And so it is unclear that the effect of all of these different practices will be the same and we need to attend to that. Second line of concern about thinking about the psychological research on mindfulness comes from pushback against people who developed mindfulness that as it is often done, particularly in modern Western culture, mindfulness is divorced from the reasons that were for which mindfulness was developed. I'll give you one example. This is from the Buddhist uh, publication Tricycle, the Buddhist scholar David McMahon. Generally, people just take one tiny slice of it. This is a particular text. Bear attention to breath and physical movements, and that becomes mindfulness in the modern world. But if you keep reading to the end of the sutra, you realize that there are all kinds of very conceptual aspects. And far from being simply non-judgmental, it suggests making wise and discerning ethical judgments and judgments on the values of various things. I'll give you just one more example. There, there are many out there. One of the co-authors on this piece is David Loy, who is a Zen teacher. One hopes that the mindfulness movement will not follow the usual trajectory of most corporate fads. Unbridled enthusiasm, uncritical acceptance of the status quo, and eventual disillusionment. To become a genuine force for positive personal and social transformation, it must reclaim an ethical framework and aspire to more lofty purposes that take into account the well-being of all living beings. It's easy to miss what you're not looking for. In psychology, we are looking for particular things. We are looking for what happens as we teach people these particular skills. We see what happens there. 
But what are we not looking at, including the background behind mindfulness? Reasons that people might be doing mindfulness. I mentioned one last pushback. Many of the people who have engaged in mindfulness research love mindfulness. And I will confess to this too, I think it's a great thing. But there's a danger that if we study what we love, we will not be sufficiently objective. We will not be sufficiently critical. And there's concern that we haven't looked as we might at the downsides of, of mindfulness practice. Might there be down, downsides? Might they not have been examined? I want to point to one excellent scholar, Willoughby, Willoughby Britton at Brown University, who has started a project on exactly this. She's seeking out people who have done various contemplative practices who, at least to the, the eye, appear to have come out the other side. And her point is exactly the one that I raised. We have been so eager to look for the good that we have to, as psychologists, entertain the possibility that we have not looked for possible downsides. We've barely begun to study that, and we will need to attend to that as time goes by. So with mindfulness as a psychologist, I say there's great promise. There are studies that are showing promise. There are reasons to think that practicing mindfulness might have benefit. And at the same time, there are reasons to be hesitant about it. I'm going to turn next to gratitude. Contemplation, a long, loving look at the real. Essentially, with mindfulness, we're saying that that long, loving look at the real is attending judgment non-judgmentally, simply being present to our breath, to the raisin, to our movement. But is that the only way of engaging in that look at the real? Another way of engaging in contemplation is to look for gratitude, to look long at that for which we are grateful, those to whom we are grateful. This has also gotten attention in the press. So this is from the New York Times. Choose to be grateful. It will make you happier. The Huffington Post, four reasons why gratitude will make you happier. I could have done many of these as well. Oops, we'll go back. <laughs> Around November, as a gratitude researcher, I start getting calls from people wanting to talk to me and get quotes about from the benefits of gratitude. Uh, there are many stories written at this point. Gratitude, too, has gotten more attention in psychology in recent years. In 2004, I could find exactly four articles on gratitude in the, the main psych database. That had risen to 35 in 2010. Still not a lot, but it's an eightfold increase in a very short period of time. There's an interest, for instance, in part, for instance, for this sort of headline in studying gratitude. How might we contemplate gratitude? There are many different practices that psychologists are studying. I'll mention two. One involves thinking about three good things that happened that day and why they happened. That's it. Think about them. Reflect on them. What in this day was good? Why did they happen? I'll give you a second exercise. Part of gratitude is expression. We find people to whom we are grateful and we express it to them. One exercise is called the gratitude letter. It is what it seems. It is a gratitude letter. You take time. In one study that I'll describe, they took a week to write this letter and then deliver it to this person you have never properly thanked. This is a way to, to take that look, to spend a week on somebody important in your life who you have never properly thanked, and then to do it. Is there any evidence that these, these do anything? I'll mention a, a couple of studies. Martin Seligman, a former president of the American Psychological Association, did some initial work he had people for a week do that gratitude letter exercise or do that three good things exercise, and he had others randomly assigned to a control group. For the gratitude letter, at the end of the week, 
The people who had written it were much happier than were people who had been in the control group. This continues a week later. A week later, you can come back, and they still feel happier. A month later, it's faded away. What about the three good things group? They looked at the end of the week, and nothing happened. They were no different from the control and how happy they were. But they kept looking. A week later, still not happier. They kept looking. A month later, they were happier. Six months later, they were still happier than the control group. Somehow this practice of thinking about those three good things had led them to more happiness. This is a college, so I'm going to mention one other uh, study. A, a great gratitude researcher, Nathaniel Lambert, and his colleagues did work in which they asked college friends to express gratitude towards each other for three weeks. They found uh, an increase in what they call uh, communal strength. People became responsible for each other. They felt responsible for each other. The bonds of friendship were built by this expression of gratitude. Interestingly, they were also more comfortable expressing concerns. For a good friendship, sometimes you will express a concern. How do we do this? Perhaps. Expressing gratitude for a while to people creates a space that allows that possibility. So there's reason to think that gratitude is helpful. Why? What, what might be the psychological benefit of engaging in gratitude? I'll give you two different ideas. One focuses on the interpersonal. Uh, Sarah Aljo has a beautiful phrase for gratitude. She says this function is to find Remind and bind. What are you finding? You're finding trustworthy relationship partners. If you're grateful to somebody, that person has done something for you, expecting nothing in return. That's someone you can trust. To remind, if you reflect back on people you're grateful to, you remember those you can trust. And it binds. What do you do? When you're grateful, you express your thanks. You give back. And in that, you build bond. In that, you form a friendship that is trustworthy. As we think about our psychological health, how important are our dear friends? How important are those people who have been with us through whatever the vagaries of life have been? And perhaps gratitude helps in that way. How else? How much of our lives is spent with a sense of deprivation? What we don't have. Think of marketing in America and how much of that is focused on deprivation. You don't have this, you need it, buy it from us. All the other ways in which we focus on our lack, perhaps gratitude instead gives us a mindset of abundance. When we reflect on gratitude, we're not just reflecting on the person who gave, but what we have been given and what we now have. Our lives certainly are deprived in some ways. Our lives are full in other ways. As we look at the real, is the part of the real that is our abundance something that is like the flowers in the movie that we did not notice changing? And does a focus on that help us to notice? So we've got some evidence. There's some reason to be hopeful about gratitude research and psychology. Now is my time for hesitation about the psychology of gratitude. Um, whoops. This one. Good. This is a review that came out just last year. It's a meta-analysis of studies on gratitude interventions. There are many interventions that have been done. Some have succeeded, some have failed. What sense do we make of all of these studies? Meta-analysis is a way of combining many different interventions to see if they worked. And this is the conclusion of this first meta-analysis of gratitude. The first fruits of gratitude interventions are in, and they show positive but limited promise 
Although we do not believe the potential of gratitude interventions has been fully realized, enthusiasm for gratitude interventions should be tempered until longer, more powerful interventions that have demonstrated stronger evidence of efficacy. We need to be cautious in psychology. The evidence just is not that strong yet, despite those couple studies that I talked about. They're promising, they're interesting, they give me hope, and they are not conclusive. And holding all of that in mind is something that I try to do as a psychologist. One way of thinking about this is to think about different people trying to be grateful. Might some people react relatively favorably to brief gratitude exercises and others not? Let's consider one sort of person. One view of who we are is that we're autonomous. We stand on our own two feet. What might be most important to us is that we are independent. If that's your view of what is central to you, how will you feel about gratitude? Gratitude implies interdependence rather than independence and autonomy. And so if we take people who are autonomous and we have them do gratitude, it seems unlikely to be as successful. One of the papers that Sheila mentioned before that is in the editorial process, so it's not accepted yet, is a set of three studies examining exactly this. We found people who are higher in autonomy, defined here as being uncomfortable either depending on others or being depended upon by them. In one study, we looked to see how comfortable they would be with presence. They were less comfortable. In two other studies, we asked how much gratitude they experience in different ways. They experience less gratitude. In those two studies, we also asked about feeling. What emotions do you desire? If you had one emotion to choose from, what would it be? Other emotions, how much do you like them? What well, we asked people, those who are higher in autonomy did not like gratitude, did not value it, did not have as favorable attitudes about it as those who are lower in autonomy. When I get back next week, uh, actually I'll get back tomorrow, but next week my lab will start a study in which we'll be examining whether people exposed to gratitude exercises over a longer period of time who are higher or lower in autonomy will be differentially affected. And that'll be some data on this. A third. It's easy to miss what you're not looking for. Again, we're excited about gratitude exercises. What are we not looking for as psychologists? What about the ethics? The Jesuit Charlie Shelton is a psychologist, was a psychologist who had a, a beautiful chapter in the book Psychology of Gratitude. In this, he had a reflection on the, uh, the possibility that people who have done great evil might have experienced nonetheless great gratitude. I'll give you just the thought experiment of Attila the Hun. Might Attila have been grateful for his hordes, for all of the plunder that he could get? Possibly, I don't know. Maybe he was not. It's hard to know. But absent a larger ethical framework, could we imagine folks being grateful and nonetheless also having particular difficulties. So I have hope again for gratitude research. I, I continue to do it. I like it. Um, and nonetheless, I have these hesitancies about the work that we're doing in psychology. So I'm going to turn to a third at this point, Ignatian spirituality. I could have turned to any, any of a number of, of practices We've looked at two forms, simply being attentive and this long, loving look at the real, just looking at it. And the long, loving look at the real, being grateful for two. There are many other traditions of engaging in this long, loving look at the real. Psychologists have barely tapped them, at least the networks in psychology in which I, I tend to run. Work in mindfulness is drawn heavily from Buddhism and its beautiful research. But there are other traditions. There are traditions in Judaism 
in Islam, in Christianity, elsewhere, of looking at the real. And the systematic empirical examination of these disciplines it is, is very ill-developed. This might be because often these traditions are not thought of in terms of contemplation. I'm going to turn back to a quote from uh, Walter Burkhart, who, from whom I got the phrase, long loving look at the real. This is going to be from the essay in which he talked about the long loving look at the real. To me, an ironic, scandalous facet of the contemporary search for the transcendent, for direct experience of the real, is that the searcher rarely seeks it in our Western culture, in Western Christianity. Ironic and scandalous because this is our ageless tradition. It goes back to Jesus alone with his father on the mountain in the desert in the garden. It goes back to the fathers of the church and the fathers of the desert. Gregory of Nyssa, finding God in the image of God that is our inner self. Antony, seeking God in community. Pacomius in solitude. It goes back to the medieval mystics, to Eckhart and Hildegard, to Roisbrook and Julian of Norwich. It goes back to Teresa of Avila, ravished by a rose, to Ignatius of Loyola in ecstasy as he stares at the stars. We have betrayed our tradition. How much when we think about so many traditions do we think about the contem contemplative practices of those traditions? If we are not thinking about them, will psychology think about them and study them? I'm going to be focusing from the perspective of the Ignatian practices because that is with the one with which I am most familiar. Um, I, again, could have gone in many directions. This is a Jesuit university, but I know that this is also a community group, so I'm unsure how many of you know uh, about Ignatian spirituality. I'm going to do a very quick primer. Ignatius was a Basque soldier born in 1491. Um, he was hit by a cannonball in the siege of Pamplona and taken back to his family castle to recuperate. He was a vain young man. Um, one sign of this is that he wanted to look good in the hosiery of his time. His leg, having been broken by the cannonball, didn't set right. And so he had them do gruesome surgeries simply to look good. This was his heart. This was his treasure. There weren't many re reading materials at the time. He asked for books. He was given two. One of the books was The Lives of the Saints. And so he would read them grudgingly, but he would read these Lives of the Saints. And then he would daydream. He would imagine being as a saint, doing what this saint had done. Other times he'd daydream about, about other things, doing the sorts of things that a nobleman of his era might do, fighting battles, winning the attention of a certain lady, all of those sorts of things. And they were all good. They were all enjoyable. He enjoyed them. But then he noticed after a while the feeling was different. After a while, when he'd been dreaming about doing these sorts of noble man things, it became empty. But after that while, he still had this feeling of fullness and happiness from imagining acting as the saints had done. And this, this was a start. From this he went on for years to follow that, ultimately to develop a remarkable set of spiritual exercises to found the Jesuits so that we can be here rather than again watching the Indians. He did many sorts of things that affect our world to the present day. I'm going to talk in a little bit of detail about one relatively accessible exercise. I'll mention briefly a second one. Then I'll speculate. Before I do this, I want to point out that as psychologists, there's not a great deal of empirical work on this. I will come back to that point shortly. 
First of one that I want to talk about is called the examine. It's an exercise that might be done in 15 minutes or so a day. Ignatius put particular emphasis on this for his Jesuits, instructing them to make sure if they did nothing else that they would do this examine. If you, after this talk, go on the web to look for how to do the exam, and you'll find a variety of approaches to it. I'm going to give one of them, but there will be others out there as well. So first step, we can ask to see as God sees. We're going to reflect on our day. This is the exam. And what is the vantage point? How does God see us in this day? We imagine here a loving God. So often when we reflect on our days, it is anything but loving. We find our flaws in ways that do more injury. So we ask to see from the vantage point of God at the beginning of this rather than our own. We're grateful for the day. And this isn't a generic, a general sort of gratitude. This is a I had wonderful Turkish food for lunch sort of gratitude. This is, I got here safely. I drove my car. It functioned well. It is all of those sorts of things that you look at in, in detail and for which you are then grateful. And from this point of asking to see from God's view and from being grateful, we then go on to review the day. It's not a minute by minute, the alarm went off at sort of review. What are the events of the day that occur? What are the places where we did something and we felt life flowing into us? What are the places where we did something and, and, and we felt ourselves lo losing our life? What are the opportunities we had during the day to love where we acted upon those opportunities? What are those places during the day when we had that opportunity and we did not act? And we reflect back on, on the day. And after that, two things at once. After that, we express sorrow. I, I, I do not know about you, but in my days, there are times that I do not love as I could. There are days that I do things that, that are not life bringing. And so I can express sorrow at that point for that. And finally, hope and resolve. I can look forward to the next day and ask for the grace to live differently in that day. And, to be hopeful in that and resolved to go forward in that direction. Ignatius develops other exercises, one of which is the long retreat, 30 days. I mentioned the 19th annotation, which I did, um, which is designed for people who can't take 30 days away in which an hour a day is spent, once a week an hour with the spiritual director. And this was spread over roughly 30 weeks. Essentially, a week is like a day. I won't reflect on all the exercises, but at the beginning, there's something called the principle and foundation in which there's a reflection on our purpose. What are we here for? How are we to choose? This is a way of looking at the real. What is our purpose? What is our intention? So again, I don't have any data, but I'd like to speculate about some of the possible psychological consequences of engaging in these sorts of practices. Plug in or power source. And this is what I did not do. I was not mindful beforehand. <laughs> so if you'll bear with for one second. I'd actually plotted this out beforehand because beforehand I was mindful. All right, we're back on. I am grateful for power strips and beeps that remind me about the power going out. 
So what might be some consequences of engaging in the, the Ignatian spiritual practices? I want to start with purpose. And I do this based on some really beautiful research came out from Wishi and Diener just a couple of years ago. They studied purpose across the world. They looked at nations and looked at survey data on how much purpose people reported. They also looked at how happy they were. And they looked at how wealthy those nations were. If you look at happiness separated from purpose, wealthier nations tend to be a little bit happier. If you look at purpose separated from happiness, we've, we've taken care of happiness, we're just looking at purpose, wealthier nations have less. Interestingly, they suggest that this effect might be mediated by a decline in religious participation in wealthier countries. Where do we find purpose? How, as we do this long, loving look at the real, how does that look involve purpose? Where do we learn that practice? Our religious institutions, our religious practices, one of the ways in which that develops and as cultures have people drift from religion, is that opportunity for thinking about looking upon purpose deteriorating? There can certainly be other ways of finding purpose, but are there cultures that haven't developed an ecology that allows for that? And so does wealth bring this decline in a sense of purpose? And do things like the Ignatian exercise focus on purpose? Again, much of the beginning of the exercises is about our intent, about our purpose. Related to purpose, to what degree do we pursue materialistic goals? What do we want in life? Do we want money? Do we want a beautiful house? There's Burgeoning research, Tim Kasser, for those of you who want to, to follow up, has, has written extensively on this, about some of the psychological consequences of materialistic goals. If our goals are material, what effect will that have on our relationships? Will others become uh, a means towards an end rather than people of themselves? To what extent will we be dissatisfied? There's good evidence that the relationships of people with more materialistic goals suffer, that there's depression, that there's more alcohol use, more drug use of a variety of things, controlling for many of the usual suspects for income, for wealth, for intelligence, for lots of other sorts of characteristics. What do we want? Um, Ignatius has beautiful exercises on choosing. One, neither wealth nor poverty. In that exercise, will that lead people to be less likely to endorse materialistic goals than they otherwise would? Second area, so one was pur as purpose perhaps, but a second area um, is about contingencies of worth. Why are humans worthwhile? Why are you worthwhile? You can reflect on that for a second. Downstate in Columbus, um, Jennifer Crocker has done beautiful work on people's contingencies. Some people believe they're worthwhile because they're good academically. This is a universe, university. This, this might be something that we think about often. I'm good because I'm a good student. I'm a good faculty member. Looking good, physical appearance is something that people say, often say makes them worthwhile. She runs through several other categories, but one of them is God's love. People say, I'm worthwhile because God loves me. She's done research then looking at how people deal with the travails of life. Stuff comes along, to what degree do people crash as bad stuff happens? Academic competent, academic competent contingency people Things go south academically, so do their spirits. More so than people with other contingencies. 
Placing our worth on our appearance leaves a similar sort of vulnerability. Those who report their worth is due to God's love, from the data that she's collected to this point, seem more robust against the stuff that happens. If our worth is, tie, if our worth is tied up in God's love, depending on our, on our theology, if we believe that God loves us, we ought to be able to continue to believe that we are worthwhile, at least, even as we are failing. And that might make a great deal of difference. A third, something called implicit personality theory. I, how do you think people work? You've got a theory. I have a theory. Um, as a psychologist, I have many of them, and I'm sure that they're not entirely right. I live my life implicitly believing I know how people work. It, I don't even think about it anymore. It's implicit in my interactions with them, and they're going to be partial. People are remarkable and complex and, and, and difficult to understand, but we act as though we do. The particular theories we have for how people work affect how we live. I'll give you one of the more developed examples of this. This is Carol Dweck's work on intelligence. Do you think intelligence is fixed? You got it. You won or you lost the lottery at birth and that's it. Or do you think that intelligence can change? People differ. And there's some degree of genetic inheritance. There's also some degree of change. It matters what you believe. If you think that intelligence is fixed, academics is torture. The next thing that you do might be the point at which you hit your limit. You fail, you give up, because this is it. Your theory of yourself is such that indicates you've hit your end. You seek less challenge. You enjoy school a lot less. In contrast, those who have a, a belief that it's malleable, that intelligence can change, failure, another chance to learn something, to develop, to grow my abilities. Maybe not said with that much grace, but <laughs> that's the spirit of it. They seek out challenge. School is enjoyable. Their theory of how they work is different, and so the reality at which they look long and lovingly is going to be different to them. It will make that difference. Our theories of ourselves matter. Might an Ignatian practice change people's theories of what people are? In particular, I think along the, the lines of fixedness or malleability. When I first heard the word exercises, it was like, spiritual exercises? Isn't this just something that people have or don't? And the notion of exercises implies that they can be developed. What is little can be made larger. The practice of exercises, does that lead to the observation that people are changeable? And understanding change with that sense that we can face tomorrow with hope and resolve, does that give us a sense, a sense of ourselves, sense of others that might be different? Okay, that's my optimistic psychology self thinking that perhaps if we start to study the Ignatian practices, we might be able to find these effects of engaging in, in such practices. But I want to be hesitant in a couple of different ways. First, we don't have data. I have a friend who used to ask me what I thought would happen in studies because I usually got it wrong. Um, so we make bets as psychologists. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not. We have to put them to the test, and we have not. But I want to go two different directions. One is a worry that I have that I also have about mindfulness and about gratitude. Why do people do these things often to be happy? Does the goal to do these things undermine their effect? There's some beautiful research coming out of Berkeley that is starting to study this, asking people, do this thing, try to be happy doing it. Others just do it. 
And some things that usually make people happy don't for people who are doing them to be happy. There's this sense of discontent. I was talking about this talk, and a, a couple of friends had their gratitude journals that they had done assiduously for a couple days and then put aside. They're there, staring them in the face, making them dissatisfied because they're not doing them. And do these exercises that are supposed to make people happy, lead people to try to do them for happiness, undermine their efficacy for happiness, and leave them as another opportunity for people to beat themselves up in ways they already had. As we talk about mindfulness or gratitude or the Ignatian exercises as things to make people happy, are we undermining the very things that we value as psychologists? Um, the Jesuit Anthony de Mello uh, gave a talk in which he pointed out a, a sign to Mumbai is not Mumbai. Happiness is a sign. Our emotions are signs. If we focus on our emotions as the goal rather than the sign, are we ending up chasing the signs to Mumbai rather than actually getting to the city? And finally, as a psychologist, there's always a concern about reductionism, a concern about what it is that we do to shrink things into smaller packages. And for this, I'm going to turn to a prayer poem by John Shea. This is just excerpts from his poem, A Prayer for Sacred Things Sacred No Longer. The sacred pearl on the forehead of the goddess has fallen to mere wealth. The impenetrable mystery of white light is bitten, priced, and strung around blasphemous necks. We are the keepers of the garden, but must our mastery turn everything opaque? Can nothing be more than it is? Are we left with the Eucharistic world ground down to bread and the horrible boredom of a wine which refuses its mission of blood? I'm a psychologist. I'm not a theologian. I'm studying the psychological effects of this. It's easy to miss what we're not looking for. If I'm looking through the prism of psychology, what is it that I am not seeing? And as a psychologist, I need to be greatly alert to that. So my bottom line, I'm encouraged about the possibility that Ignatian exercises might be helpful for psychological health. But I have all re sorts of reasons as a psychologist to be cautious.